welcome to another episode of The Platform. Great fun to have Emford Jones on the show. He's a super talent and here's an example of some of his stuff. I'm as cheesy as ever, lifetime prankster Hey, you know, I say I gotta be more gangster More R&B, more rock, more pop More something that I'm not just to reach the top I ask on top of what? On top of your hits, on top of your sh** Man, I'm on top of your b**** And I'm working it deep from dust to dawn Busting up and I'm gone as we mush on We mush on Get up, get up, man, cause and effect You know the rap, some say sleep's the cousin of death But most folks sleep, walk through life Eyes wide shut, blinded by the big city lights Some like to take life cause they don't know the meaning Like them sick them up kids dressed out and fiending With so many pressures, we're all so precious We're all rock stars, God bless us Yeah, so we've been mates for ages And I thought it'd be awesome to get him on the show We actually had him on season one really quickly He came in to perform uh, But great fun to get him to jump on Skype And we filmed this It's so good to have you on the show uh, Mate, I, you know I love doing a show about stories So let's, let's go back to uh yeah. to, <laughs> where'd you grow up in australia i grew up in well two parts as a kid i grew up in the hills of perth in an area called kalamunda mm -hmm. it's sort of kalamunda gooseberry hill i think it's like one of the most beautiful places on the planet and i mean i've, I've traveled a fair bit and I, every time i go back there or at least to perth i'm always trying to get up to the hills i mean the coast is amazing but there's something magic in those hills like i think it's very sacred land and I was blessed to grow up on it. It was awesome. Um, honky nut trees, uh, honky nuts everywhere, you know, you blow into them and whistle. Right. <laughs> yeah, you ever do that? No, you know, man. They have the little nut, little honky nuts, whatever it's called, and you blow in it, make crazy whistling sounds. I could uh, blow on a, a eucalypt leaf and make whistles. Yeah. Flower petals and make whistles. Wow. Um, running around always barefoot. Uh, it was like gravel everywhere and at my bike and we lived sort of near a national park so I was always in it my brother used to get me lost in it and take off on me sometimes <laughs> that'd be scary but he'd be like boogeyman's gonna get you <laughs> um, and then when I was around eight years old um, my mother had an opportunity to buy a house um, that was part of like one of those new housing land package deals yeah and it was cool but the neighborhood we moved to was pretty horrific and pretty violent. It was like going from this sweet tree sanctuary to this this real end of the burbs, rough, rough place. But um, it was horrible, but it was also really informative and helped me grow a lot. I mean, somehow I never got bashed or into a fight, and that's a place where everybody did. Wow. Everybody. I kind of, uh, I don't know, it's like I had like, um, I know, like I had a, like a, like some sort of, um, cross on my back where everyone would be like, oh, no, that's Emphali, leave him alone, he's nice, he's like the neighborhood, you know, safe zone or something. <laughs> that's a pretty interesting mix, I guess, to lead into artistic endeavors. So was that, did that inspire your music and, and being artistic at that time? Yeah, I mean, my, I might have missed the point. My older brother was massive, so there's a chance no one touched me out of <laughs> yeah. You left that bit out. That my older brother was massive. He's still massive. I never outgrew him. I was so pissed off. Wow. When I was about six, I raised my fist to him and I was like, you wait till I'm 12 and you're, you know what I say? He, I was six, he was 12. That's right. I said, you wait till I'm 18 and you're only 12. I said, then I'll watch <laughs> it. And, um, but it never happened. I never grew older than him, never grew, outgrew him physically. So, um, but he was really the guy. Like everything to do with me as a creative person is really... I mean, my mother, yeah, she was awesome. She was a painter, artistic. She supported us doing artistic endeavors and said, be as wild as you can be. If I wanted like a crazy haircut, she'd be down. You know, she was like that. She was dope. But, um, and, it, you know, it was rough growing up without a father and it wasn't my father's choice or fault. It's a long, heavy situation as to why we didn't get to grow up with him. But, um, so we had left London when I was three came to Perth where my mother was from, moved to some view. And I think uh, my brother was really the one who was into music and started discovering hip hop records, my brother Kabar. And he would bring home like Big Daddy Kane albums, LL Cool J records, Public Enemy, all kinds of stuff, NWA. And some of it was quite shocking to listen to, and uh, but I kind of liked it, you know. And my mother wasn't so sure, but she thought, well, you know, as long as it's not, sexist and violent, which a lot of it was. 
Um, and he was really the guy. Like he, he'd be like, "Hey man, you, you can be like my little, like my little side, my little side wing dude, you know, and you can come and rap with me and stuff." He was five years older. I was, so by the time I'm ten, this crazy smart fifteen-year-old kid who was having a hard time at school and getting through classes and just fitting in, too big. You know, big kids get picked on a lot by adults. It's crazy, um, but. He was the guy who was like, try and rewrite other people's verses into your own lyrics. Try and do this, try and do that. Be more articulate. I can't understand you. You mumble. You can mumble when you talk, but not when you rap, you know, all this kind of stuff. Mm. At 15, he was thinking like this and started to make beats. We'd, we would catch a bus, two trains, and do a long walk through a dodgy neighborhood to this guy, Two Shy's house, because he had a mic, a four channel little tape machine, and a drum machine, and decks, so we could make <laughs> life loops and he was he was amazing and we had this group called uh, deadly fresh and um you know to be honest i feel like that group was so good and deserved the opportunity to actually be known as a legendary australian group because they were around and doing stuff but it was so hard to make moves we had no money there was no internet mm. we had to make tapes like we, had, we just did stuff and made stuff but through all those years of just my brother kind of grinding and me coming home to hearing and making beats and saying, you know, try and write, try and write, try and write and helping me with my raps as a little kid. It was more almost like a father in a lot of ways. Um, I just started forging a style and um, instead of, say, getting violent like some of my friends or literally stealing cars and having highway chases like some of my friends or robbing banks like some of my friends or just whatever, um, I would write rhymes. If something made me furious and I wanted to bash someone, I'd be thinking, oh, I could write about this. And I'd just usually just leave. People are like, where's he going? I'd go home and start writing. Obviously, you know all that all that effort as a kid and passion in music, and you end up like doing twelve hundred techniques, which had great success. How did how did that come to be? One of the like sort of I guess livelihoods for me was that there was a place called the Evelyn, and I, I knew some guys from a band I'd been in when I was fifteen. My brother was twenty one, but he had friends who were like twenty eight in Perth, and would play like the Fly by Night Club and different things. I was I'd get to rap a bit back up brother and um that a couple of the guys from that band were in melbourne so they'd be playing they'd say come through i basically i could rap for free beer and company wow. so i would be there with my bro and um and we met this dude super flamboyant track suits like fresh clean <laughs> shades rings chains i was just like wow what's, what's with this dude and that was peril dj peril and uh he was just like, hey, man, I make some beats as well, you know. And I, I'd i say I liked the music I was doing with my brother more at that time. But Pearl's energy and his beats were super bouncy, and I kind of liked the bounce in front of it. So I used to hang out and write and just do things. My brother was kind of into it, not as much. Mm -hmm. um, we started gigging a bit. We had a few different names. We didn't really have a name. And then I um, was starting to pen a lot of the songs. My brother mostly wrote our first single called Hard As Hell. My brother's on that and wrote most of it, really. I just wrote my verses. He wrote the rest, really, and came up with the concept. And then Ken, with the guitar riff, and the Pearl probably programmed the best drums he's ever he ever did. Um, and that was just building. And we um, were starting to make some moves. We hadn't really decided on a name. We finally came up with the thought. Perro had the idea because we used the Technics 1200 turntables. He thought about just flipping that to the 1200 techniques because we had many styles and we mixed different genres into our thing. We didn't want to just do straight hip hop boom bap. We were trying to mix genres and do things that we were all into from, you know, boogie, electro, b-boy music to blues rock and and just 
um, lyrical rhymes as well as party chats, you know, many techniques. Um, and my brother moved abroad, moved to the UK, and I was left in Melbourne and I thought, well, I'm going to just go pedal to the metal with this group and see what we can do. And it started working, like, we, it was different, you know, because Peril was really connected with all the good events and parties. He was super famous even as a teenager for, for his graffiti and his b-boy. And before I knew him, I didn't really realize how famous he was until, like, years later. It kind of dawned on me. Oh, that's why he was like that. He was a super famous kid. Wow. Like, who's famous, you know? Right. And um, so any time there was something, he'd be like, yo, can my band play? Oh, can my MC come? And we're talking the techniques, talking the techniques, and the word kept spreading. And then when we hit got the opportunity to uh, sign a little independent label. Um, Hard as Hell came out and, you know, I knew people who could make videos, I had friends in that world. And it was just like, bam, like, that was it. Everything started changing and we started getting opportunities to tour with groups, groups we wouldn't normally get to because it wasn't like hip hop groups to tour with, you know what I mean? Like there was no one above, above us. The only way we could do hip-hop tours was super underground. We weren't doing that. We had a live band. We used to cop shit for it. Now it's like the blueprint and everyone does it in Australia. It's kind of annoying. But <laughs> So we'd tour with all kinds of stuff, but like from regurgitator to like sort of almost dance party groups to uh, uh, Lincoln Park when they did a national tour. We got on all these different things. We supported Snoop Dogg way back. My brother was at that show. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's when we were more straight hip hop, but we slowly started blending and blending more into our thing. And um, yeah, it was wild. Just having that build and well, having a song. You know, just, most, most people dream of like having a song on the radio. That would be a pretty epic feeling for people in their bedroom to like creating a song that people around the country are listening to. And you guys with Karma, that was that was a monster hit and that must have been pretty cool. Yeah, that was monstrous. I mean, Hard As Hell was the first one I heard on radio and I was in with my girlfriend at the time and she turned on the engine and the song started at the beginning. I was like, did I give you my tape? And she's like, No. Wow. I said, well, how have you got my song on your car? <laughs> goes, I don't know. I said, she goes, maybe it's the radio. I was like, what? And she like switched the dial, switched back, and it was playing. I was like, what? That's oh, awesome. Oh, it was one of those, yeah. <laughs> those moments. And uh, it was amazing. Yeah. And so then it was just steps. And Karma, you know, was a song we played in every set. And it was always my favorite song. The rest of the group liked it. But slowly, a lot of other people would come and say, that kind of chilled song, that one. It's really good. Because before the final mix, it was more chill, but then we amped it up a bit more. And, uh, you know, having friends like a super genius friend of mine who's now a world-renowned director, but having friends like Michael Gracie, who was just a kid himself with a crazy vision and skill set, to get involved with all his friends to make the video for Karma was just nuts. And when that hit, like everything had been set up from the EP release to the different shows to... 1200 Techniques was becoming like a hot thing. Karma. It goes around, comes around, right? right? How you treat people is how they treat you back. Disrespect them or knock them, they're gonna slap you back. Yeah. Sometimes it hurts, and that's bad karma. Watch out for it. How am I supposed to live? Well, for the negative. How am I supposed to love? Fit like baby, I am man. I got the iron tongue and the iron hand. I'll make the final stand. The final showdowns come round and hit ya. As I throw down my gauntlets and twist the picture. If ya look in the mirror, you're bound to get a reflection. Like with every action, there is a reaction. With your dodgy actions, you're causing negative drama. And if you know God's law, you best watch for karma. No, I'm a bomb ya. Running in traps like taps. You think you're floating on the cream? You and your rap pack. Well, I'm take that. Go back. Now let's dwell. How I should like you like jail cells. So we can exhale. I'm a bull. I'd use a man as I'm seeing red. You out of I'm a target like. You float in a space like astronauts I started off life, but now I'm first While you're shaking the cut off like umbilicals at birth I don't know what time it was in, in, in the timeline And I probably know you don't like talking about it But that popular ad where you were the genie for Tim Tams So those ads, I mean, I was 
They were popular ads, so I'm imagining what your life was like. Did you keep the hair that you had in the ad for a while? I mean, that was my hair. It's not like I kept it. It's not like they gave it to me and I got to, like, become something. Like, that was me. The script, the script sucked. I improv and changed all of what I did. Like, I should have got paid for writing my parts, wow. realistically. Like, that's not the character. I wasn't even meant to be there. It was my mate, Ollie was there for the casting. You're kidding. I'm waiting for him. He's like, yo, we should go in and do this. And I thought, oh, what is it? He goes, it's just like TV genie. Girls, eating Tim Tams in your Tim Tams. Good one. <laughs> Look what I find for you, Dalene. I'm fine. Three wishes. Girls, we've got company. I wish you dressed up for us. Uh, I wish you were on the other side of the world. <laughs> Oops. You better wish him back. Call from Vladivostok. On its Tim Tam, what more could you want? And realistically, the only regret I have, if either I hadn't done it or if I had, is that maybe I should have tried to pursue acting. Because now they've made the Aladdin film, and I feel like Will Smith's playing my part. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I've been telling you for 10 years you should be acting. Yeah, this is true. This Absolutely. Is true. Well, man, you know, look, there was a great ad and it must be fun to look back on, but you've, you've, you've created some awesome music and I want to ask you about a song, Life's a Game. Mm. Um, do, you, do, you just, do you hear the beat first in your mind then start creating the raps or do you get the idea for the lyrics first and then try and work out a beat for it? It varies. Sometimes I just start singing melodies like Karma. I sang a melody and then I thought, oh, that would work on that beat that Peril gave me. So I quickly ran and recorded the hook idea that just came to my head and then freestyled after the first verse and wrote the rest. Um, sometimes I just have melodies and I go, hey, I've got this idea, let's build something. In the case of Life's a Game, Sensible J, who I think is one of the greatest producers I've ever met, and I've met a lot. He, um, he lives in Melbourne, works with Remy, House of Beige. I've worked with him in my band, Cool Out Sun, still. We're very good friends. He had made that beat uh, with his mate Dutch, it was his neighbour from down the road. They'd been making beats together for, for years. And they had put together that sound and that sample. So it was already there. It's from a song. But the way he looped it and worked it was crazy. And all the parts he put together to create this. And I just, all I was trying to do was add extra colour to this beautiful template. Right. And it didn't require much other than just not screwing up what he'd already done. See, we could play this life sort of like it was a game. Ain't talking sidelines, watching Michael Jordan do his thing. It's the power of the now. Worlds away from Hollywood and watching us. The powers on the couch is the power of the mouth. And overpower in the mind. So only think about those things that will define you. Underline you, never undermine you. When you understand that, your mind is what defines you. See, I was trying to be someone I wasn't. Locked with the demons in my closet. Robbed of my freedom. I can't believe it's something that's as easy as believing in myself. Was the genie in the box? Oh, I know this never ended. Sort of like a hopper with the vengeance. Based upon the kindred spirit, you descend from a legend. Right there in your face, trying to gain your attention. Life's a game. Life is just a game. There are many ways to play. People probably do know, or some might not know, that you had a really, really deep friendship with Heath Ledger. Mm. Growing, up, growing up with him and he directed that uh, I mean that for me I'm, I'm friends with Heath too and I saw the video for Seduction is Evil and I was like oh my god this dude is going to make the most incredible feature film one day but that video must have been awesome and that's another song I love Seduction is Evil oh thanks man um, yeah I appreciate that it was awesome making those videos especially I really like I enjoyed making the Seduction video because it was massive I didn't, I felt super uncomfortable because it was so massive, but I knew it was something he wanted to go through for himself. Yeah. Work on working on a large scale thing. It was really a self investment for him to work on directing something that was quite a large scale production. It's not the way I would, would operate normally, but he was like, I, I want to try this out. I'm like, man, I'm happy to be that dude and yeah. do that with you. Like, even, you know, just. Whatever. And so when he did that, he came out of it at the end, actually. Like, I've made something cool, but I don't know if, if that's where I, how I want to do things. So next time he comes around, he goes, I've got this other idea for cause and effect. And it was just one camera, the opposite, in his garage, 
one or two lights and just some face makeup ideas that he can sit put together with these amazing makeup artists. And so when we came out of it, I think he was like, yeah, that's, that's how I'll direct more simple, close, less big, more real art house style, you know? So for, for me, it was like helping him have a vision on something that he could try techniques of directing. Same when he worked with Ben Harper, Ben was the same. Ben was honored to be working with him. Ben Harper loved the cause and effect video. Ben told me he used to bump that album and that, oh, that song in particular in the tour van. Oh, wow. When they were getting ready to play, that was like they'd get him hyped. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so, you know, I've been blessed to have been introduced to some amazing people through Heath. But, uh, yeah, making the videos was amazing. But it wasn't really, for me, it wasn't about me. It was about helping a friend see his vision. And I was blessed that the visions were dope and I got to be part of something super dope. Um, I would have probably put the album out with no videos otherwise and just been like, yeah, I made a cool record. Yeah, yeah. You know, it became such a big deal because he was attached to it and... Um, yeah, you know, no, great. At, at the time, there were some negatives, like haters being mad, like really, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. but obviously, once the tragedy happened, it's um, looked at the way it should have always been looked at. That it was just dope. Yeah, I thought those videos were just epic. <laughs> Essentially honest, man. Blast off like a rocket. She bring more heat than hot pockets. Yeah, yeah. Who wanna stop it? Zen for a root shot. Electrified, I shock it. Snatch a chain lock it. Sell it to the pawn shop. The 25 cents, Yanks call it a quarter. Your daughter should be a porn star. The way she work my head, I like adore her. Spend my 25 cents on her too. Sucker to some tucker. Barbecued roux. I stay true on a perilous beat. Make your girl delirious whenever I speak. Snake charmer, body and bomber. Bring life to your girl, cause you're a rocker. Uh, she's hot, she's hot, right? Uh, she's shining like a spotlight. Yeah, working it up, right? Yeah, I'm just saying she's hot. Uh, she's hot, she's hot, right? Yeah, she's shining like a spotlight. Uh, pushing it up, right? Yeah. I'm just saying she's hot. So what's been going on lately, man? I mean, I know we had you on the show the first season and you were, you were starting, I think at that time you just started working with the guys and you had cool out sun, but what's been happening since? Um, I've just been just walking step by step and not chasing outcomes, not chasing the life that might have been or the life I was heading towards and just really appreciating the life I have, the children I have, the friends I have, um, the life I have. And... Um, you know, that led to the formation of Cool Out Sun, which wasn't really a planned thing. It was just, let's just make some cool music. Um, I also ended up, you know, I started looking into, after I had the cafe, I had a cafe called Kalimba, did like Creole, uh, French Creole, Melbourne food. It was really good, it was really successful. But with the birth of my daughter, I was like, which is a third child, I was like, I want some more time. Someone turns up 
wants to buy the cafe right at the time. Like, I swear he's hanging out, you know, doing his magic. So out of that, I ended up getting called from a Box Hill Institute. It's like a, it's like a TAFE, but they have a really amazing music institute where they do masters and degrees. And they called me up to write, asked if I was interested in trying to write a syllabus of music based around hip hop. So I was, thought, wow, that'd be a first of its kind. Yeah, fascinating. That's cool. So I got involved in that. Now I finished writing that syllabus with three of my uh, close friends, and we deliver that. It's been a year and a half now. Still developing it, getting better at it, but been doing that. And loads of Cool Out Sun. I mean, Cool Out Sun's been doing great. We got to play. We got to play Womad Festival. <laughs> nice. Which is one of my dreams. Like at this point in my life or career to play Womad and world music vibe, which is where I really started with my brother. It was more of a world music thing. Um, to play that was as exciting for me as my first proper big day out. Like it was that same level of, I can't believe this is happening. Like I thought I was done with music. I thought, oh yeah, I had a good experience, but you know, I should be grateful. I actually got to do something. I had an amazing 20s. My best friend was one of the greatest actors in the world. I chased Liv Tyler around his house with a mask on once because it was <laughs> and we hung out. Like I, I got to go and hang out with Naomi Campbell at her birthday. I've, I've been to beautiful places from Prague to, to Venice to New York to getting into a skinner in the box because of my homie. You know, I had other homies, yeah. but, you know, I've had an amazing 20s. And I thought, you know, in my 30s, I started thinking, Oh, you should just be appreciative if you got to do it. Most people are still in their bedrooms trying to figure out how to get their first opportunity. So shut the fuck up <laughs> and move forward. And once this really started doing that, it's funny, like everything started to flow again in the right way, you know. And, um, yeah, I can't complain. Everything's okay. Like I don't own shit, but everything's pretty good. Senseless, they'll attack relentless for 40 days and nights and 40 ways they'll try to tempt us. But you must stay resilient, cause your aura is brilliant. A single beat never the man can overthrow the millions. No, you're not the million. This world is your dominion. Recognize life, speak truth, and that's opinion. Well, and it's been great having you on the show. How do people find you online now and they can check out all your stuff? Uh, the best thing, really, like. I'm not really an online person. Like there is Ant for Jones, nfajones.com. Don't think it's been updated for a bit. But <laughs> I, I definitely live on Instagram. So Ant for Jones, NFA Jones, or NFA Jones Instagram, or Cool Out Sun. So Cool Out Sun in the Sky Sun. Um, that's pretty much all I'm working on. And then the documentary, which is called Burn Gently, which is about sort of like burning too bright too quickly, burn gently. Um, that's something that's being worked on and I guess you'll hear about more next year. Um, be good to chat with you about that too, actually. Awesome. Sep separately. But yeah, if you want to find me, that's pretty much it. Cool Out Sun, Info Jones, and hopefully more to come. But for the most part, I'm mostly a father and that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's the most important role of all. The fact that I get to do some cool stuff on the side, work in music, teaching and workshopping different things like i feel very blessed awesome man well good to have you on the show good to catch up and uh wish you all the best with it cheers lovely be good man so there you go super fun to have him on the show thank you for watching and we'll see you next time on the platform yeah.